I am so glad that you decided to join us on this Tuesday, the final Tuesday of our Easter season. It is, of course, May the 26th. We're so glad that you decided to join us. We will look at the lesson for uh, this last Sunday, Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 14. We didn't get the opportunity to take a look at that this Sunday as a part of our Sunday lesson. And so let me read to you from the uh, book of Acts. So, when the disciples had come together, they were asking Jesus, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and of all of Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. Now after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. As they were gazing intently into the sky, while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here looking to the sky? But Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, he will come in just the same way as you have watched him go. So they returned to Jerusalem, from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. Now when they entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas his son, this, the son of James. These, all with one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Here is the lesson. Let us pray. Bless our time together as we look at the Word of God on this uh, Tuesday uh, in, in the season of Easter. May you continue to bless us and be with us during our season where we are apart from one another physically. But we pray that your church would continue to be faithful to your calling that you place upon our lives. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. For our lesson for today, we do want to take a look at this. This is, of course, a lesson that took place right after the resurrection, a short time afterwards. And Jesus had made several uh, revelations of himself resurrection revelations of himself to several of his disciples and here he is his final revelation he revealed himself one last time to his disciples before he'd be taken to, uh, from them and taken to heaven to sit at the right hand of the father so again in this case he reveals himself to all of his disciples now it is interesting to notice a question that the disciples asked of him they said lord is it at this time that you're restoring the kingdom of israel now, I find that really an interesting question. That's verse 6. If those of you who have your Bibles open, they are still, his disciples, focused on a physical, materialistic manifestation of the kingdom of heaven in their presence. Now, Jesus does not deny that God at some point is going to reveal himself in this way, in some physical and materialistic manner. And it will exist at some point in the future. However, what he does deny that they will have anything to do with the coming of this kingdom of heaven. This is not, this domain is not under the control of the disciples. And so they are not to occupy themselves with this physical manifestation of the kingdom of heaven. It is under God's domain. And I find it really sad that there are some Christians to this day who still try to fixate on the when Jesus is coming again. Well, Jesus is coming again. In fact, I've been asked that many times in these last days. Don't you think that these are signs of the end times? Well, sure. But you know what? We've been in the end times for 2,000 years. The day will come when God will be reestablished as the ruler of a materialistic physical kingdom. Maybe not, uh, we're told that there will be a new heaven, a new earth that's going to look different. It will be a physical, uh, it'll be a physical presence. Uh, we'll have a physical presence in some way there. It's going to be different than the one that we enjoy now. But those days and those times are out of our control. And so God is gracious and kind. I always tell folks, the fact that we are still here is an indication of the goodness and the kindness and the graciousness of God. And so we should not be fixated on the end of days. Um, we should be fixated on what we are supposed to do in the time that we have. And this is what Jesus is trying to tell his disciples. Stop fixating on some type of physical manifestation of the kingdom of heaven 
and just go about into the world and do your job. I think that's a lesson that we need to learn as well. And so what does he tell them? He's, he goes on to tell them, you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, this message will then be your responsibility to take to the entire planet, to the ends of the earth. Now, one of the things I find fascinating about this command of God, or this gift of God to us, is that there is to be no militant, no authoritative, or authoritarian, or totalistic response to Jesus Christ. We are not supposed to go out of our way to establish some type of physical, militaristic, authoritarian presence of God in this world. And I think Christians have gotten this wrong throughout the centuries. From Constantine on, the church has all been about, uh, about occupying the world, about colluding with physical governments, politics, and combining politics and religion, and this is always a wrong and deadly mix. I'm sorry to say, but the United States of America is not God's kingdom upon this world. We are not supposed to even think in that manner. We are not supposed to be militant or authoritarian or totalistic in our response. We are not supposed to be political animals. The only thing that the disciples are to carry with them into this planet, are you ready? I'm going to put this up right in front of you so you can make no mistake of it. The gift of the Holy Spirit and the love that God has placed in their hearts. Oh, did you see that? There's no weapons of war on that list. They are not to carry uh, M1 rifles or M16 machine guns. They are not called to make nuclear weapons. They're not to call, call to make smart bombs to kill everybody and all those terrorists. What are they supposed to carry with them into the world? The Holy Spirit and the gift of love. That's it. We have nothing else. And so I am telling you, any Christian who is fixated on military responses, on smart bombs, on atomic weapons, on national boundaries and borders are not focused upon Jesus Christ, but on materialistic things of this world. I don't understand militant, materialistic Christianity, which is represented so often in this country in the United States of America. Christians, it was Christians, let me just tell you this, you know, I, I, whether you're aware of this or not, we do have a nation today called Israel. It is not the same country as existed uh, two and three thousand years ago in the Old Testament times. Um, these are not necessarily even the same people. This country, Israel today, was set up by militant Christians, Zionists, not by faithful Jews. I can tell you this for a matter of fact, the Jews were vehemently against, I should say the religious Jews, the faithful Jews, they are vehemently against establishing or re-establishing the nation of Israel. Because they knew it would just bring nothing but heartache and pain and war and grief. But some Christians, the Zionists, wanted so bad to establish the nation of Israel as a country to fulfill the biblical prophecies. Did you see what Jesus told his disciples? He didn't say that we're in the process or in the purpose of nation building. It's not up to us. It is in God's hands. So I think militant Zionism, Christians who supported it, are in the wrong. Now, we have this country called Israel. doesn't mean I don't support them. I think it's a wonderful country. And we must pray for them. We must support them. It's a reality today. But I'm not convinced that this was God's will. It was militant Christianity, colonialism, which has damaged the witness of Jesus Christ's love in this world. See, faithful Jews got it. It was no longer about being people of the land. It was about people being people of the book. What we are called to do as Christians is to trust God, to carry out his mission to do what? To take the Holy Spirit and love, not some militaristic culture, 
not some Zionistic or colonial type of culture out into the world and impose it upon people. Christians and Christianity cuts across national borders. It's not about materialistic, nationalistic concerns. It's about Jesus. It's about the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's about love. So if your faith is anything more than that, you've got a faith, you, you've got things that you are intruding upon your faith that are not of Jesus. Jesus knows as long as he is here, we will have an insular faith, and so he ascends to heaven, the Bible goes on, the passage from Acts says. And so therefore, now that Jesus has left us, his, his physical presence has left us, he's given us the gift of his Holy Spirit, he's given us responsibility for his love, he trusts us. We've not always been faithful. We've not always deserved that trust, but Jesus still trusts us to be faithful to take his Holy Spirit, to take his love into this world. I know, today, we live in a time where we are separated from each other, and there are many churches that are just hell-bent on trying to get back to worship, because it's all about gathering together. Well, I think worship is really important. It's important for us to gather together. But yes, the church is an essential part of the fabric of our culture, but... And worship is important, but I can tell you that the early church did just fine without mass gatherings of Christians for worship every single week. They did just fine. The church was turned, the world was turned upside down by small pockets of Christians, not mass worship services. The church doesn't stop its doing its job just because we can't gather together as we normally do. We're fixated on physical manifestations or physical materialistic uh, non-godly things. We as the church need to be fixated on what? Taking the gift of the Holy Spirit and God's love out into this world. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have the church are really being found out for what we are. We are materialistic. We're militaristic. We are nationalistic. All of these things, God, are sins. They're sins. And we repent of these things to you, God. Because you have not called us to impose our nationalism upon other countries. You've not called us to, to create weapons of war. You've created, called us to take out your love to this world. The gift of your Holy Spirit. These things transcend materialistic and nationalistic boundaries, God. And we, the church, are to be united in this. So when our Christianity becomes confused with being an American citizen, that's a problem. Because then we have to impose Americanism on a country to bring Jesus. Jesus didn't tell us to take Americanism out to the world. We are called to take the Holy Spirit and God's love out to the world. Let that be the only two resources we carry with us wherever we might go. Because then... We are truly your church. For he asks us all in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you again for joining us. Look forward to seeing you this Sunday for Pentecost. Again, not physically. We will not be here together. Not physically at the church yet. However, you are welcome to join us for a Pentecost service in the celebration of the gift of the Holy Spirit. May God's blessing be upon you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.